Amen. Let's go ahead and stand and turn to our in our Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 5. If we would this morning, we'll go ahead and dismiss the use of this time. Boy, I don't know if they can set in here today. They are wound up. Amen. They are wound up today. 2 Kings chapter 5. When you find that, let's go ahead and stand up for the reading of God's Word. We'll read verses 1 through 14. My title this morning is, let's see if you can figure this out, Naaman's Disease, A Picture of a Sick World. Naaman's Disease, A Picture of a Sick World. Kind of excited about the next uh, probably 14, 15, 16 weeks uh, in the morning service. What I'm doing is Christine has been uh, talking to me about, boy, she sure has been praying. Uh, she's been telling me this for some years about getting a ministry going back into the nursing home uh, to where she has, uh, she would like to see, of course, uh, us her holding a church service in the nursing home sometime during the week or on Saturday or whatever it might be. And uh, this is all part of the great plan, our grand plan, I believe, of hopefully coming over here and living closer to the church and kind of getting to where we can get more involved in our community by being closer to the church, of course, and uh, doing uh, some things here at the church, getting things uh, uh, um, more, I don't know, spending some, just some more time uh, on the church, with the church, and doing things for our community. And this is, would be one of the things that we could do is uh, we could go in the nursing home and holding a church service there. Now, we don't know exactly when it will be, um, um, but when Christine started talking to me about it, I started to put my mind to what would I preach there at the nursing home? And, uh, and uh, what, I, what I decided to do is, you know what, it would be neat to go through and take the, the ordinary stories out of the Bible and kind of just put a little bit of a, and, and I don't believe it's putting a twist to it at all. I believe a lot of the stories in our Bible have to do with uh, salvation and have to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, so you can just about find the gospel in everything. And uh, this was one of the first stories that came to mind. And uh, I, um, so I'm, I'm testing it out on you guys and not really testing it out. I think it's for us as well. Um, but I have about 15 or 16 or 17 just quick outlines that I wrote down as I was thinking through the Bible uh, just in the last week or so. And uh, so this morning we're in uh, 2 Kings. Now we're, we're not going to start here as far as when I start preaching through these uh, sermons. We're going to go all the way back to the beginning of the Bible. Now what good is that going to do for us? It'll just help kind of cement those stories in our mind and kind of teach us the Bible as we go along. And uh, yeah, some of these will be very familiar to you, but we'll, we're going to put a little bit of a gospel twist, And uh, but it's not just going to be for the unsaved, it'll be for us too. And uh, so we're in 2 Kings chapter 5, 2 Kings chapter 5 this morning, and we're going to start reading in verse 1. Now many of you probably know of this story, you probably have read it before, and uh, if not, this will be new to you, but that'll be great. And uh, you'll start learning some things about your Bible as far as the basic stories of the Bible and how God has used them uh, to speak to our hearts about the gospel and about just his love and his goodness. And so we're in, uh, in 2 Kings chapter 5 and uh, starting in verse 1. And this is what it says. It says, Now Naaman, uh, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man uh, uh, with his master and honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man and valor. But then look at those last, what is that, five words. It says, but he was a leper. And it says, and the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away a captive out of the land of Israel, a little maid. And she waited on Naaman's wife. Now when it's talking about that little maid, she was an Israelite girl, a Jewish girl. And it says, and she said unto her mistress, Would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in uh, Samari, uh, Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go to go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him 10 talents of silver and 6,000 pieces of gold and 10 changes of raiment. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel saying, Now when this letter has come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman, my servant to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. 
And it came to pass, when the king of Israel had read the letter, that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive, that this doth send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore, consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. That kind of tells the spiritual condition of Israel at that time. Because what's going on here is the king of Syria has a, has a man that is a captain of his host. And he's a great man. And it says he's a great, uh, he's a, he's a great man with his master. In other words, the king of Assyria thought this, this uh, um, captain of the host was a great man. He was honorable. And he was a mighty man in valor. And so what he hears is that they, of course, have defeated Israel. And they took captive one of these uh, little uh, Israelite maidens. And that's probably what she was, was the maiden for the king's wife. And uh, this, this little maiden tells the king's wife, hey, um, we serve a God that could heal your, your great captain uh, of leprosy. And so what this king of Syria does is he writes to the king of Israel and says, hey, send one of those prophets that represent that great God that this little maiden is telling us about. Now, I'm saying all this to say it kind of tells you the, uh, the, the uh, mindset or the spiritual condition of Israel at that time. Because the king of Israel, when he gets this letter, says, Who am I that I'm going to heal this man of leprosy? Well, you ninny. He's not asking you to heal. He's saying, send the God that you serve to heal. The prophet that re represents your God. And so it kind of tells you the spiritual condition of the king of Israel. He's not even thinking about God. He's thinking, who am I that I'm going to heal him? Well, that's not what he was asking. So then look what it says. It says, and it was so when Elisha, which is, of course, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent to the king saying, wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. And so do you see what Elisha does? He basically tries to spiritually straighten this king up and says, he's not asking you to heal. He's asking for our God, you see. And I'm a representative of our God. See, that's the spiritual condition of Israel. They're kind of not even thinking about God. And that's why they're in the trouble they're in most of the time. So then in verse 9, it says, So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. But then look at verse 11. It says, But Naaman was wroth, and went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come, to, come out to me, and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, and strike his hand over the place, and recover the leper." Are not Abana and Farpur rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. Then look at verse 13. Then it says, And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid, it, it said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather than when he saith to thee, Wash and be clean? And then it says, then went he down, so he relented. He listened to what a servant said. In verse 14, it says, then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful, Lord. I pray that you help us. And Lord, again, what we're doing this morning, Lord, is, uh, Lord, we want to see, Lord, in a sense, just your power and your love. And, and Lord, we realize, Lord, that your Bible displays many times through these Old Testament stories uh, the love that you have and the power that you have. And Lord, it's not just about salvation, but it's even about just to remind us sometimes of exactly who you are. And so, Lord, I pray that you speak to our hearts this morning. And I know that I'm standing before uh, probably the biggest share of our folks that are here this morning are saved. And so we're not, we're not necessarily thinking about what it takes to get saved. But Lord, it sure is wonderful to be reminded of the loving, powerful God that we have. And so Lord, I pray that you speak to our hearts in that way if need be. And Lord, help us to be strengthened and encouraged in this time that we can be together in your word. 
Lord, I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. How many of you have heard of Lou Gehrig's disease? Anybody remember, or does anybody, this was before my time, but does anybody remember who Lou, Lou Gehrig's disease was named for? What was Lou Gehrig? Who was Lou Gehrig? He was a baseball player. He's probably even before most of your time uh, because he was a famous baseball player back in the time of the 1930s. And what had happened is, of course, this great baseball player contacts uh, and is diagnosed uh, with a disease. And what they did is because he was so famous, uh, they named that disease after him. And Lou Gehrig's disease has another more scientific name for it. It's called ALS. You probably have heard of that. And it's called amyotrophic uh, lateral sclerosis is what it is. And it is a sclerosis that eventually shuts down the body's functioning, uh, even right down to the breathing. So what happens is it takes away your motor skills. You, you eventually can't walk. You, you, know, you can't move your hands. You can't do anything. And your, your wheelchair bound can't move. It's almost like you're quadriplegic, like you've been broke your neck or something. It just, you're just shut down. And then it even goes to the point uh, to where it takes your ability to breathe away, you see. Now, you may remember that we had a, a sweet missionary couple, a home missionary couple, um, that they were called the Lafreniers. And uh, Abby Lafreniere, um, you probably remember the story, that we started supporting this, uh, this uh, young church planting couple that were uh, uh, planting a church over on the East Coast. Um, I can't remember exactly where it was, uh, but it's up, up along the East Coast. It wasn't quite up to Maine, New Hampshire, something like that. And, uh, but anyway, they were planting a church up there. Well, uh, Abby Lafreniere ended up being diagnosed with ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease. And uh, she, she went to a, a walker, and then she went to a wheelchair. You might remember she had a little boy, just cute as a little, cute as a little button. And uh, she passed away probably about two years ago. And within, I don't know, she probably had it for maybe four, uh, five years. And it, it, uh, each letter, it, it, you know, her prognosis was not good. And she got to the point where she was less and less able uh, to take care of herself. And then finally it got to the point where it just stopped her breathing and uh, she passed away. A sad, a sad story. And uh, so as I said, what it does is it shuts down the body functioning right down to breathing. Now this morning we read about another type of deadly disease, and I'll call it uh, Naaman's disease, but it's better known as leprosy. And of course we know uh, what leprosy is. Naaman's disease had a crippling effect um, where it rotted the body to the bone. You know about leprosy, how uh, it starts with the outer extremities, the fingers, and I can't even imagine this that basically your body just continues to, uh, to rot away and uh, it, the, the circulation basically uh, shuts off and like your, your digits, your fingers start falling off and uh, you just, I mean, your ears fall off. All your outer extremities just start falling off. Your nose basically uh, starts to uh, uh, lose its blood flow and it falls off. That's what leprosy does. And it gets down to a point where you become just one big, and I know this sounds kind of disgusting, you're just one big putrefying sore that succumbs to affection and eventually your body succumbs to death because that's what leprosy does. Now, my full title this morning, and I already uh, mentioned it, it, it's called Naaman's Disease, a picture of a sick world because that's what we're going to use this for this morning. Now, did you know, and I already kind of mentioned this, that the Bible not only has the ability to re reveal to us a loving, all-powerful God, but it also always, it seems to always want to portray a sin-sick world, you see. And so I want us to see something about Naaman's disease this morning. And let's read our verse one again. In our text, uh, get open right back up there to Second Kings where we were. And uh, look at what verse 1 says. It says, Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master. 
and honorably, honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor. And then again, those last few words, it says, but he was a leper. Now my first point when we look at that verse and, and kind of going in the direction that we talked about in our, in our uh, uh, introduction this morning, first thing we need to know is that Naaman's disease made a good man rotten to the core. And so when you look at that, did you catch that as we read about this, that God's narrative goes through the trouble to tell us how good this man was? That, that it, says, it says that Naaman was, it says he was great, he was honorable, and he was mighty. But at the end of that verse, it says yet, or but, uh, he was a leper. In other words, he had leprosy, you see. Now, again, listen to my title, Naaman's Disease. And, you know, a picture of a sin-sick world. And so Naaman's disease, what it did was make a good man rotten to the core. Now, have you ever heard the expression, he was a bad apple? You ever heard that expression before? Now, what that expression has to do with is, of course, I guess when you think about it, an apple has the ability to look pretty good on the outside. But what happens is sometimes you can bite into an apple, and I don't know if I've ever had one like this, but you can bite into an apple, and there's times where I bite an apple and it's, it's pithy, uh, where it, it's soft and it's kind of, it, it feels like it started to rot and it doesn't have a good taste to it. And it seems like no matter where you bite out of that apple, it has that same taste. And basically what you do is you spit it out and you go, Ugh, and you just basically throw the apple away. And, and so what I'm saying is, um, we've heard that expression that he was a bad apple. And so an apple has an ability of looking good on the outside, yet it's rotten on the inside. Now, now with leprosy, it's different than that. What it almost is saying here is that here's a man that was good on the inside, but he had leprosy. He was rotting on the outside. And what was happening is, is basically uh, he was going to rot away and this good man was going to succumb to this disease. Now, uh, yet what the Bible says about Naaman, he was a good man. And, and not only good, but he was great and he was honorable and he was mighty. Yet, he was rotting away. Now again, God has a way to not only show us a loving, all-powerful God, but he also has a way of showing us a sin-sick world. Now, all of mankind... When we think about Naaman and we think about what's going on here, I think God wants us to think about something. That you know what? All of mankind has a disease. And it's much worse than Naaman's. Now I know what you're thinking. How in the world could anything be worse than having leprosy? I mean, I can't think of anything that could be worse than that, than having leprosy and having your everything fall off and you just become this big, ugly, putrid mass of, of infection until the point where it, your body just succumbs to the infection and then you die. How can anything be any worse than that when you think about it? But, but when you think about it, you know, and then, and then you think about, you know, how can anything be worse than Abby's disease? What that poor girl had. Here is Abby, 26, 28 years old, I believe is what she was. And, and over those four or five years, I think she was 28 or so when she died. Over those four or five years, here she has a beautiful little child and all this. And it's just heart-wrenching to think that this poor girl, you know, wanting to care for this child goes from uh, basically a walker to a wheelchair to where she can't even lift her hand. She can't feed herself and, and just, just slowly succumbs to the Lou Gehrig's disease or to ALS. You know, how can it be worse than that? You know, after again, after all, she dies at 26, 28, and how tragic that is. But, but what wasn't tragic about Abby's disease is that although she died with ALS, she had a much worse disease. What? She had two diseases? Yeah, in a sense, she did. She had a much wor uh, worse disease, but the, the one that was worse, she had got a cure for. Well, what was that disease? Well, years before she died of ALS, and I don't remember exactly what it was. I, I don't know Abby's personal testimony, but she had a disease called sin, you see. 
You know, the, the, the disease of sin not only kills the body, but destroys the soul. Now you might think, I've never heard that before. Well, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And that's what Christ told his disciples. And so just like I said, no matter, no matter what is going on in this world and no matter what disease we could contact in this world and die, and boy, there's a lot of that going on, isn't there? I mean, ALS, cancer. Uh, um, another one that uh, a lot of people are con uh, contracting is uh, MS, multiple sclerosis. And uh, sometimes people can live with that, but there's sometimes it seems like it takes people pretty quick. My uncle had multiple sclerosis. His name was Carl, Uncle Carl. And I remember his, his degradation. He went from, it seemed like them diagnosing him with a disease to where the next time I seen Uncle Carl, he was walking with a cane. The next time I seen Uncle Carl, which was probably about six months to a year later, he's walking with a walker. The next time I seen him, he's bound to a wheelchair. And then the next time I saw him after that was at his funeral. It seemed like within four or five years, he had succumbed to multiple sclerosis. And there's tons of people being diagnosed with that in our day. And so, like I said, there's tons of disease out there. But what's amazing is, but there's none as bad as this disease known as sin. Again, what, what uh, Christ told his, dis, uh, his disciples, he said, he said again, and fear not them which will kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So we're all born, in a sense, with an incurable disease. And the Bible says it's rampant and will not miss one person. Romans chapter 5, verse 12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men. There's not one of us going to miss the disease of sin. All of us have it when we're born, and all of us will die with it, and die, at, uh, as it says, a, 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 just a, a miserable death, a second death, if we don't get it cured. But that's what we're talking about, Abby, is, is as bad as that ALS was for that poor girl. What's amazing is she had a disease much worse, but she was cured of it. And so when she died of ALS, what's amazing about that is, man, when you think about her going through that trouble and uh, through that time in her life where she was uh, chair bound, and, and the sad thing about ALS, ALS too, just like uh, multiple sclerosis, you're aware of it all. You're aware of the body being shut down. There's no mercy on the mind when it comes to having those diseases. You're aware of every bit of it, you see. And, and But yet what's amazing is after she took that last breath, she would have woke up in heaven. And of course, had a, would have had a, 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 uh, a perfect body after that. I mean, what a, what a glorious uh, time that would have been and will, and will be, you see. Now get this. One thing everybody knew about leprosy is it is uncurable. If you got it, you got it, and you're stuck with it. And you'll die of it. And that's what the big deal about Naaman was here. That's why it was such a death sentence back in the Old Testament to be, to be pronounced with leprosy. Just like a death sentence today would be to be uh, pronounced to have ALS or Lou Gehrig's. No cure for it. They might be able to slow it down a little bit, but it's gonna, it, you're going to succumb to it eventually, you see. And many cancers are that same way. Now look at verse uh, 2 and 3. It says, And the Syrians had gone out, of, out, out by companies and had brought away captive of the land of Israel, a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. And so what we need to realize now is this, that as bad as this sin-sick world is, and as bad as Naaman's disease was, and as bad as ALS is, there's a cure for maybe not them specific diseases, but there's a cure for, this, for the worst disease you could ever have, sin, that even a child knows about. You know, and I think about all these kids that are in this, 
uh, in this morning service. And sometimes as impatient as I can get because they get to where they just are so about themselves and just yakking away and not paying attention to what's going on here in the church service. Man, what a blessing it is to have them. And to realize that they're being taught about the gospel of Jesus Christ and how that's the cure for the worst disease you can ever have. And every one of us have it. And what's amazing, what we're talking about here, is in the, in the story of Naaman, that the cure that was suggested to Naaman, a child knew of it, you see. Imagine this little Jewish maid telling Mrs. Naaman, you know, something like this. Now, I know even as a child that leprosy has no cure. But even as a child, I know something that many don't know. Imagine this child having this conversation. And what did she know? Look at verse 3 again. And she said unto her mistress, Would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. Now every little Jewish maiden would know that that prophet in itself doesn't have the ability to heal. It's who that prophet's representing. You know, when people, I would hope that people realize that, that when you go to church, um, your pastor doesn't have healing abilities. Now, I know you can be duped into believing that. You can watch on TV and you can watch these goofy uh, TV evangelist preachers and all that where they're slapping people on the forehead and they're healing them. But really, when it comes right down to it, we have no power to heal people. But what we do is we represent a God who does have the power to heal. You see. And so that's what this little maid knew of. Yes, she talked about the prophet that was in, uh, in Samaria. But she was talking not necessarily about him being the one that has the power to heal, but that he represents someone with the power to heal everybody. You see. Because again, that child knew there was no cure for leprosy. But even that child also knew something that many don't know. You know what she was saying basically is, my God has the cure. Now how can it be that a child can know this, but not an adult? You see, well, it's simple. Uh, Matthew 18, 4 says, Whoever, whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same as greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now, of course, Christ was telling his disciples that, and he wasn't, he wasn't talking about the little maiden back in the Old Testament. But what he had was he, as, as Christ is trying to tell people the gospel of Jesus Christ and how to get saved, he had children standing around him, of course, and he was saying, you know, it's going to take someone with a humble spirit like this child to understand what it takes to be cured from this, this, the, uh, the, uh, the disease of sin and to believe on it. And to realize that that's going to cure them. And so, again, he said to them, Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same as greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So God's cure for an uncurable sick world really is very similar to verses 8 and 10. Look at, look at verse 8 in our text. And it was so when Elisha, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot, and stood at the door at the of the house of Elisha. And so when we look at this, we see what Naaman's doing, or, or what the prophet's doing. As we read verse 10, uh, we see what, what Elisha wants. He says, send him my way. I'll tell him about the God who can heal. You see. And so we'll look at what Naaman's response is. Now, the reason I do this is because this is the same thing we do in this world today. We hear about how to be healed, but many times we look at it as foolishness. Naaman was hearing what he needed to do. If he was going to get healed of his leprosy, Elisha, the prophet of God, was saying, send him my way, and I'll tell him what he needs to do. And it's real simple. But then look at Naaman's response. Look at verse 11. It says, but Naaman was wroth, and went away and said, behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of his Lord and God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. See, he was looking for something, something like, like uh, a TV evangelist would do 
where basically he was looking forward to what this uh, man of God would do is call him forward and, and raise his hands in the sky and cry out to God and then clap his hands together like, like a clap of thunder and maybe slap Naaman on the head and have some type of uh, great you know uh, promotion take place to where all of a sudden Naaman's healed. But it wasn't like that at all. What he was basically doing was telling Naaman, you know, send him my way. And what I'll do is I'll tell Naaman what he needs to do to get healed for, for his disease. And so when you look at that, and you look at uh, uh, what he told him to do, look at what Elisha told Naaman to do in verse 10. It says, Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. That's how simple it was. Naaman, if you'll just come, and if you'll go dip in the, in the Jordan River and just dip in there seven times, and that last time when you come up, you'll be clean. And Naaman was wroth. And of course, Naaman slams him and says, you know, there's a lot of other rivers that are much better than the Jordan. You know, you can just hear what Ray, Naaman's response is. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Here I have a disease that is uncurable, and this moron wants me to dip in the Jordan. You know, and he, he might be saying to himself, if that was going to do it, everybody would be doing it. That river is filthy. Now, I didn't study this out much, but I'm thinking, you know, what he's thinking is that every nation borders that river and dumps their garbage into it. And we have, a much, we have much more pure rivers up our way. And here, this, this, this prophet of God wants me to do that. Now, what I point that out for is, boy, isn't that the typical response today? If you've ever been involved in talking to somebody about the gospel, and what it takes to get saved. That's kind of like their typical response. When you confront someone with about salvation, God's way, they say, why can't I work it my way? Why can't I do it my way? My way's better, it seems. And you remember that song that says, and we do it with the kids all the time, there's no other way to get to heaven. Jesus is the only way. But see, when you approach people with that, boy, they, they want to do anything they can to figure out a different way. That's kind of what Naaman was doing. But look at his service response, verse 13. It says, And his servants came near, of course, this is after Naaman was wroth, and he went away and said, Behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call him in the name of the Lord, his God, and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper." Yet this fool wants me to go dip in the Jordan River seven times. I mean, if, if, if that would cure me, everybody would be doing that. And so he turns away wrath. But then look at his re the servant's response. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather than when he saith to thee, Wash and be clean? I mean, why? You, why would you want to have to jump through hoops uh, to, to get a cure when the, the prophet of God is just saying, here's something simple you can do? You see, it isn't that just like salvation today. To where when you start talking about to people about how to get saved, boy, they just can't believe it, you know? And isn't that the epitome of a sin-sick world? A cure so simple that it makes it seem unattainable. That's the mentality. Yet all he had to do was submit. You see. Look at verse 14. So he relents. It seems like the servants bring him back to his senses. And they say to him, had he commanded you some great thing to jump through hoops and do a couple backflips, wouldn't you have done it? To be cured from a, cure, uh, a disease that's not curable? Wouldn't you have done that? How much the more would you do it if he just said some simple thing to do? It's just like salvation for us. You know, I think sometimes when you're dealing with people, they just think it's so simple that that can't, be, that can't work. Try it. You see, they want to make things so complicated. 
And the epitome of a sin-sick world is a cure so simple it makes it seem unattainable. Now read verse 14. So then what's he do? He relents. Naaman does what he's told. And he went. It says, then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And of course, what's it say happens? And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. So there it is, folks. Cure for uh, leprosy was worked out by the miracle of God. Now, what I wanted to show us this morning is that, you know, we have a loving God that goes way beyond that. Because as I said, there's a disease in this world today that is incurable. And everybody has it. And the only way that you can be cured from that disease is one way. There's no other way. And I believe that's what God wanted us to see through the story of Naaman. There's a cure that, that for sin that is so simple that what happens in this world today is people often turn away from it. Just like Naaman did when he turned away from hearing what the cure for leprosy was. But then what happened was someone was there to encourage him and he relented and did what he needed to do. Now, I do have to say this. Naaman had something that we don't have. He had a putrefying body that reminded him that he had that disease. See, our problem today is, is we can think everything's fine for us. We, we can know that, you know, according to what God's word says, that all for all have sinned to come short of the glory of God. But there's nothing on the outside that really in, indicates that. And what he's talking about is the sinful heart that we have. And that if we die with that sinful heart in us, then what's going to happen is we're going to, we're going to die a second death that's going to cast us into the lake of fire. But God said it doesn't have to happen. That he has the cure. He can cure us. And that is, of course, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from that, from that uncurable uh, sin disease. And so, again, Naaman had something to remind him that he needed to be cured. Now, what I thought about doing is, is basically everybody just take a look at their hand. And when you look at your hand, you say, you know what? Nothing wrong here. But then what we've got to realize is that, you know what? That's the problem. It is sin is a disease that stays below the surface. And unless we're taught, unless we're shown it by the word of God, we can live our whole life not realizing we have it. But that's why God shows us through his word. That's why, that's why when we talk about our loved ones in our, in our community around us and the parents of these children, we need to convey to them the, the, the disease this world has and how this is a sin-sick world. And there's only one cure for it. And that is, of course, the blood of Jesus Christ. So that makes, doesn't that make sense then why I named this, this sermon Naaman's disease, a picture of a sin-sick world. Amen. So my challenge to us is, and like I said, I'm probably talking um, to the choir when it comes to salvation. I know that. But our encouragement is, is to realize, you know what? We just learned a, something a little bit more that helps us to realize what we can do for this world, to convey to them the, work, the disease that this world has and how incurable they are without the blood of Jesus Christ. We have the answer. Amen. Father, we're so grateful, Lord. I pray that you continue to bless us. And Lord, grow us closer to you. And Lord, it sure is good, uh, Lord, to get into your word. And just as I mentioned uh, earlier in my message, that it's amazing, though, that this Bible not only has the ability to reveal to us a loving, all-powerful God, but it also has the ability.